Good morning, group. Today's topic, or this week's topic, I should say, is plyometric and speed training. So there's two chapters that are going to be covered. I'm, I'm like 90% going to focus on chapter 18 because there's a lot of crossover between speed training and plyometric training. And um, this could get very complicated, right? But I'm going to try to keep this topic as simple as possible. And really just kind of give you the, <clears throat> the information that you need to know in order to then feel comfortable digging into this topic in more detail if you should need to for your uh, future career. Okay. So plyometric training is the focus of chapter 18, which we're going to dive into here first. Okay. So plyometrics is based on essentially the, the theory that the tissue in our body has elasticity to it, specifically uh, the connective tissue uh, and the tendon. The tendon is what connects the muscle to the bone. That this tissue is elastic and then when that tissue is loaded and released, energy will be released with it, okay? <clears throat> Think of this as similar to a rubber band, right? Uh, when you stretch the rubber band out and immediately release it, it's gonna snap back and generate some force. Our connective tissues in our body operate in much the same way. So when we rapidly stretch those tissues as we do during an eccentric phase of a muscle contraction, when that's when the muscle is lengthened, that tissue is stretched. And if we immediately, and when I say immediately, the the prevailing thought is it has to be released within three seconds. So if we then transition into a concentric phase of contraction where the muscle shortens within that three second time period, that, that energy stored in the elastic component will be released and increase our force production, okay? A good way to kind of think about how this would fail is if you squat down and you hold that position for say 10 seconds and then jump up, your jump will not be as high as it would be if you squatted down and immediately jump back up, right? You have to rapidly stretch the tissue and then immediately release that energy in a concentric attraction. That is how plyometric exercise is the most uh, effectively done. And if you think about athletics, because most, most all movements in athletics are rapid, Plyometric training is going to be a very um, important thing to include for athletes because they can increase, increase muscular power, which means your ability to exert force with speed will increase, and that's going to be an important component of improved performance in almost every single sport. Okay, The only one that the only set of sports where it might not be important would be like um, very long distance endurance type of events such as uh, marathon training or marathon running long distance cycling, long distance swimming, etc. Any In any sport where you're rapidly producing force, plyometric training is going to uh, be an important component to include. <clears throat> so um, some other terms to, to think about and, and other terms that are used when we're talking about plyometric training. The first one is the series elastic component. So that really is going to refer to what I was talking about on the last slide. The elastic component of the musculotendinous unit is the tendon and the connective tissues that that tendon is connected to. Uh, in the series, part of the word, refers to the fact that um, your muscle and your tendon are in line. So they're in series with one another. So when the muscle contracts and shortens, the tendon is going to be stretched as well, right? So they're in series with one another. And that's sort of what this um, part of the graph shows. You have your, your muscular component indicated by the sarcomere, uh, and then the tendon component, sorry, is located in series with that muscular component. Now, up here, we have the parallel elastic component. That kind of runs alongside of the muscle. So... The series elastic component is going to refer to the tendon where the parallel elastic component that's going to refer to the connective tissue that surrounds a muscle okay and those layers of tissue are listed on the slide here okay 
Think of that as like the uh, the muscle cell membrane and then the other connected tissue layers that surround the muscle. Those are the parallel elastic component or the series elastic component is going to refer mainly to the tendon. Keeping in mind that there would be a tendon on both sides of most, most muscles. Okay. <clears throat> now, our nervous system greatly contributes to plyometric training. Okay. And we have touched on this in previous lectures, and I'm sure you remember, remember this from previous classes as well, that we have um, this reflex in our body that is called the stretch reflex. Okay. There are special muscle fibers in our muscles that when they are rapidly stretched, that signal is sent up to the nervous system and the nervous system immediately sends a reflexive response of contracting that same muscle. Okay. That is another way to increase force production. And that is why typically doing a rapid eccentric contraction followed by a concentric contraction can make that concentric contraction more powerful. Okay. So not only do we have the stretching of the tendon and the storing of energy in that tendon, but we also have the nervous system component that contributes to increased power as well. Both of those involve a rapid stretch of the muscle. Okay. So by rapidly stretching the muscle, we get an increase in force production. Plyometric training is found founded upon utilizing those two <clears throat> components, the series elastic component and what here we could call uh, the stretch shortening cycle. That is the, the overall phrase that we use to refer to this more nervous system component that we're talking about on this slide. <clears throat> uh, and here's a visual representation of the stretch reflex. So we have the intrafusal muscle fibers that these are referred to as the muscle spindles. These are the ones that are sensitive to stretch when they are rapidly stretched. Uh, the signal is sent up here to the nervous system, and in this case, in the spinal cord. And then there is an immediate reflexive response where these extrafusal fibers, or what we would think of as the regular muscle fibers, they rapidly contract due to that stretch that occurred, stimulating the intrafusal muscle fibers found in the muscle spindle. Another way this is commonly described is if you've ever been to the doctor and he hits your knee with a, he or she hits your knee with a hammer that rapidly stretches the muscles fibers in your quadricep causing the reflexive contraction where your knee extends and your foot kicks out, right? That is one way that the stretch reflex can be measured and um, assessed by a doctor, but that also hopefully gives you a good visual um, understanding of what occurs with the stretch reflex. This also occurs really whenever we're lifting weights. Uh, and again, that whole nervous system component is referred to as uh, the stretch shortening cycle, which then includes the series elastic component, which is the SEC, the SEC referring directly to the stretching of the tendons. Okay, so all of these factors that we've talked about thus far contribute to what is known as the SSC or the stretch shortening cycle. Okay, uh, and this chart here, this table sort of breaks down the different phases. You know, in the eccentric phase, that's when the muscle is stretched. So we have the elastic energy is stored in the tendon and the muscle spindles are also stimulated. The amortization is kind of like the transition phase. Okay, and then in the concentric, the elastic energy is released, providing energy, and then the muscle is stimulated by the motor neurons that were originally stimulated by the stretching of the muscle spindle. Okay. So this is kind of like the priming phase, transition phase, and this is like the execution phase. And here's, you know, a, a more concrete example of, of what might occur, right? When the athlete is doing the, the preparation to, to jump, planting the foot on the ground is going to load tendons by stretching them. 
there's also going to be a reflexive stretch in the muscle. So that then when the athlete explodes off the ground in the concentric phase, the energy that was harnessed during the eccentric phase is released and thereby allowing for uh, this explosive, sorry, this explosive concentric contraction that is visualized by the jump and the landing. So when we're considering using plyometric as part of a training program, we would still, you know, think about this when we're doing um, our needs analysis. <coughs> Excuse me, bless me. Uh, we would still consider this when doing our needs analysis, okay? Um, so, of course, you know, certain sports are going to have certain needs, certain positions. Uh, the training status is very important for plyometrics um, because just as we saw with, with intensity last week, um, in, in keeping the loads lower for less experienced people. We're going to want to do the same thing with plyometrics. Okay, we're going to reduce the overall volume, reduce the intensity of the plyometric activity for less well-trained individuals. As training status increases, we could increase the overall volume of plyometric training and increase the intensity of the drills. Okay, um, dr the drill can be scaled, sort of a very basic plyometric for beginners would be skipping, okay? A more advanced plyometric for advanced athletes would be like drop jumps, which are very intense, okay? So you would wanna not use drop jumps with beginners, but you could use drop jumps with advanced athletes, okay? So again, we, could, we can consider all this when we were doing our overall needs analysis that we did last week, so I'm not gonna have you um, do another one of these, okay? I'll just ask you some specific questions. Uh, again, we're gonna use our same athlete. In the case study, uh, Jasmine, and think about some different plyometric needs that, that she might have based upon her sport. So let's think about the mode um, for plyometrics. Basically, there's two modes, um, either lower body or upper body. So let's go back to lower body for a second. Um, pretty much every sport is going to require lower body participation, therefore, Almost every sport is going to need a lower body plyometric. Okay, not every sport will need upper body plyometrics, but almost all sports will need lower body plyometrics. When we're thinking about what to include, um, think about the, the the direction of the movement for sp the sport. Right, um, for a track athlete, the movement is all forward. There's no lateral movement, so there's no reason to include lateral plyometrics with a track athlete. But with the basketball player, there is lateral movement, so we would want to include some lateral plyometrics for basketball players, okay? There's a lot of different drills. Um, so here is sort of a, a basic list of some lower body um, plyometrics. And these are ordered in terms of the intensity. So this would be jumping in place is sort of the most basic one, okay? And I, like I mentioned, skipping, skipping could even go above this. Skipping is like the most basic and the, lo the lowest intensity plyometrics. So when I'm working with like older populations, I do like to include some plyometrics because plyometrics are not only important for sports, they're important for life as well. Skipping is kind of like the first thing I would use and maybe the only thing I would use with, with older populations. Okay, uh, And then intensity increases as we, as we go down the table here. Um, you can you can look these over on your own in terms of the description of them. I have a supplemental PowerPoint that I'll show you quickly that actually shows you some pictures of these different drills here so you can get a feel for what they look like if you have a hard time visualizing it just from the verbal description. So then our other mode would be uh, upper body plyometrics. So the most basic type of upper body, upper body plyometric is a medicine ball toss. Now, you can throw a medicine ball on many different planes. You can do a chest pass, overhead pass, um, reverse kind of overhead throw that way. You can do a twisting throw. So, again, you would want to think about the needs of the sport uh, and incorporate the direction of the throw based upon the direction of the upper body movement that's used in the sport. Um, catching can also be a plyometric. Basically, like, think about this. That's a good way to load them. If somebody tossed me a medicine ball, and I caught the medicine ball, loaded my muscles in the eccentric phase, and then immediately released it and threw it back to them. 
that's going to be a more effective way to utilize both the eccentric and the concentric phases of the uh, contraction to practice my plyometric activity. Okay, um, plyometric push-ups is basically a push-up where you explosively push up and you leave the ground for a short period of time and then you land, absorb that energy, store it, release it again in the plyometric push-up. That's a more advanced type of exercise, right? Somebody needs to have a pretty high level of strength to be able to do a plyometric push-up. Um, and also their body weight would come into play with that as well. So medicine ball throws are more appropriate for all populations where, where plyometric push-ups might be a more limited population. Um, as far as the trunk goes, that's kind of what I was regard talking about regarding like, you know, rapid twisting and throwing a ball. That's a good example of a trunk plyometric. But if there's a lot of twisting involved in a sport, such as like, I don't know, with golf, um, baseball, where you're, you're twisting your torso and you swing the bat, a trunk plyometric could be handy for athletes in those types of sports. So the intensity is something to think about for sure as well. I've already mentioned this. So, so things to consider when you're when you're talking about intensity um, are listed down here. So uh, the points of contact. <clears throat> if you're doing a lower body ply plyometric, your points of contact are either going to be one or two, and that's based upon the, f the feet you're on the ground. Two points of contact, a double leg activity is less intense then a single point of contact, a single leg activity, right? So introduce lower body, double, double point contact first, then transitioning to single point contact because that's going to be more intense, right? Um, the speed of the drill, right? The, the faster the drill goes, the higher the intensity will be. So initially with plyometrics, you could introduce them at a lower rate of speed and then increase the speed that will increase the intensity, right? You can do a slow skip with a beginner, and as their, <clears throat> as their training status grows, you can increase the speed of the skip to make it occur faster. That's going to increase the intensity, okay? Uh, the height of the drill, you know, think about this. Jumping on a lower box is easier than jumping on a higher box, right? Uh, and then the body weight is not necessarily something you, that you can control, but just remember the more somebody weighs, the greater the intensity will be for a plyometric, right? Which makes a lot of sense. But again, that's not something you can control. So if you have a, let's say you have a heavier athlete, they would do less repetitions than a lighter athlete, okay? You can scale the repetitions based upon the body weight because you can't reduce their body weight, right? Their body weight is their body weight. So if you have a heavy athlete, less repetitions would help sort of counteract that higher load represented by their larger body weight number. Uh, frequency. So, you know, typically it's recommended, as we see here, two to three sessions per week. You want to allow, I don't know why that says 42, 48 to 72 hours, so two to three days between sessions. Um, so you could probably work on like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for advanced athletes. With beginners, I would start with two days a week. So maybe like a Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, allowing for more time between sessions because they're less accustomed to the stressor. You don't want to overload them and get them injured. <clears throat> the recovery within the session is listed here. So it's, it's going to kind of vary based upon the drill. Depth jumps are typically seen to be um, one of the more intense drills, so allowing for a longer recovery time between repetitions, five to ten seconds is appropriate, where with like a skip, you know, you can go boom, 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 really no rest between repetitions. Uh, then it's recommended to get two to three minutes of recovery between sets. You want to allow for full recovery because explosiveness requires the athlete to be well rested, okay? Doing plyometrics in a fatigued state really defeats the purpose of it. You want to do plyometrics early in your session when you're well rested because explosiveness is dependent upon neurological drive and fully charged energy systems. And if either one of those things are lacking, the intensity of the plyometric drill, drill will be reduced and the athlete's not going to get the full benefit. Okay. So the more intense the drill, the longer the rest period should be. So that kind of matches what we saw with like regards to 
the higher intensity weightlifting, the, the heavier the load, the longer the rest period should be. Similar concept here with uh, plot metrics. This is a good point to point out real quick is that a lot of, a lot of uh, fitness classes, they'll use plot metrics for conditioning. That's not really the purpose of plot metrics. Plot metrics should not be done for a hundred repetitions or for two straight minutes, right? To really get the full benefit out of them. It's a shorter duration activity done with full explosiveness in a rested state, not when you're tired and as a punishment, basically. So the volume is really maybe the, the biggest, the most important thing. Um, how is volume measured? So for lower body drills, a repetition is represented by a foot contact, okay? Or possibly is a distance covered, but usually it's foot contacts, okay? For upper body drills, it's expressed as basically the number of throws or the number of catches, or if it's plyometric push-ups, the number of push-ups, okay? So this is a great guide to use, and there's a question you're gonna have to answer using this chart here, okay? So for, and, and you'll have to use this on your case study, your critical thinking assignment as well. Pretty simple, right? The, the, the less experience the person has, the lower the foot contacts or throws would be versus an advanced athlete who has considerable experience, they're gonna be able to do more foot contacts or more throws per session, okay? So just like repetitions in a way, right? Um, the more experienced they are, the greater the volume of exercise they can handle without experiencing injury, um, undue fatigue, uh, et cetera. So foot contacts is the way that we measure repetitions for lower body plot metric training. I wanna make sure you all are clear on that statement. Um, now the program length, so that's kind of referring to like, you know, how long this really matches up with resistance training, just as most resistance training programs are six to 10 weeks in length, Plyometric training would be very similar. And in fact, as we'll see in a second, plyometric training programs often work in conjunction with resistance training programs, particularly like in the off season, uh, pre season for, for athletes. Okay. Um, progression is going to basically follow the similar concept we've already talked about. So we're not going to talk about that much other than to kind of go back and indicate here, um, as their experience level grows, progression would look like this, increasing their volume. And we can also increase the, uh, the intensity of their drill by using more complicated drills, progressing down that table that we looked at a few slides ago. <clears throat> now, um, just a few considerations about the session, right? A warm up is important for plyometric training, just as it is with any other training. Often warm-ups are best done kind of mimicking the activities that you're going to do as part of your workout, right? So if you're doing um, depth jumps, box jumps as part of your plyometric program, doing some low intensity squat jumps, um, maybe low intensity broad jumps, activities are gonna mimic the activities that you're going to do. That would fall into the specific warm-up course, you know, the general warm up is again, just kind of some light cardiovascular activity, <clears throat> excuse me, to increase your body temperature, uh, etc. <clears throat> now let's talk about some special populations here real quick. You want to be careful with, with children doing plyometrics. The good news is a lot of times their body weight is low. So the load on their muscles and joints is going to be much less, but their joints are gonna be more susceptible to overload injury because their end plates have not sealed so their bones have that soft ends, right? So we would really just kind of use the same approach we'd use with an adult is consider them a novice, begin with le less foot contacts, less intense drills, um, longer recovery period. Um, down here it says, their recovery time, you know, again, at least two to three days between sessions, that kind of matches what we saw um, earlier. So really there's not a whole lot of difference with the progression with adolescents and adults. Just consider taking a, a slower approach, we might say, with regards to introducing and then progressing adolescent athletes, okay? For masters, this is the, uh, the way that we, were, <laughs> this is how we refer to old people now. <laughs> 
But what does a master's mean? Basically like the 65 and older um, demographic. I personally think that life does require some explosiveness, even when you're old, right? If you fall, getting your leg out or getting your arm up to catch you requires some rapid motion. So training people to still be able to retain that explosiveness is important for injury prevention, things of that nature, right? So including some basic plyometrics such as medicine ball throws, skipping with master's populations, in my opinion, is a good thing to do, right? We just need to be maybe more mindful about overloading their joints because a lot of master's people are going to have joint problems anyway. They may have excessive body weight. They might have some injuries they're dealing with. So lower intensity drills, maybe the lowest intensity, um, more recovery between plyometric training sessions and then lower overall volume. Okay. So again, this is going to match pretty much what we would think of with regards to resistance training with the master's population as well. Now, often athletes are going to be doing resistance training and plyometric training at the same time, which is common in not only athletic populations, but general populations as well. You're not going to do like a day of just plyometrics really with most populations. So you're going to be doing both, right? So how do we incorporate that? All of the words on this slide are best summarized on this chart, right, that we see here. What this is showing us is that optimally, you're not doing plyometric and resistance training in the same parts of the body on the same day, right? So upper body for resistance on Monday, lower body for plyometric on Monday. Lower body for resistance on Tuesday, upper body plyometric on Tuesday. Now, you don't have to do it this way. I don't know that this is practical, in especially like in a fitness setting. But what you could do is you scale it. So maybe like on Monday, <clears throat> you're doing mostly resistance with a little bit of plyometric, right? Then on Tuesday, you do mostly plyometric with a little bit of resistance, okay? So there's different ways that you can mix it together, but the key is you don't wanna just hammer it heavy resistance, heavy plyometric every single day because that's gonna lead to injury, right? What you wanna do is when you increase one, you back off the other, and then you back off that one and increase that one, right? There's an ebb and a flow to this stuff that we're doing here. And again, these patterns exist in almost every type of training that we've been talking about all semester long, right? As the intensity goes up, the volume has to go down. And that's kind of what we're seeing on this chart as well. If you can remember that um, in the strength and conditioning fitness training world, you're going to um, save yourself a lot of at, um, what's the word I want to use here? You're going to save your, your clients really from experiencing discomfort, pain, injury, etc. And that's going to alleviate your state of mind because the last thing you want to do is hurt another person. Okay. Um, for aerobic exercise now, power and aerobic ability really do not go hand in hand. That's kind of a one or the other type of thing, right? Because they use different muscle fibers. Aerobic exercise uses mostly type 1 fibers. Plyometric uses mostly type 2. You can't really train both optimally, right? So you need to consider what the needs are of the person you're working with. If they want to become more powerful, you want to do more plyometric, less aerobic. But if they want to run a marathon, you need to bump up the aerobic, reduce the plyometric, okay? Because as the bullet point says here, um, high volumes of aerobic exercise will have a negative effect on power production, okay? If you have to do them on the same day, it's recommended, you know, if you do want to incorporate some plyometric tra training with aerobic athletes, is you do that first while the athlete is fresh prior to aerobic training, really, because that's going to uh, produce a lot of residual fatigue, which would last for multiple hours and trying to do plyometric training after aerobic training would just be pointless to be totally honest. So do the plyometrics first 
and then go for your distance run. Um, all right, let's finish up with a little bit about technique safety considerations. Um, technique is super important for plyometrics. I think that maybe the most important thing is teaching people how to land softly, right? If you think about your lower body as like a spring, okay? When you land, you want your spring to compress gently. That's going to be much softer and easier on your joints. If you land stiffly, that's going to always create a jarring effect on the joints. So you want to land and let all your joints flex to absorb that impact. It's kind of like a spring works, okay? So that might be a good place to start with like adolescents or beginners, teaching people how to land softly. You know, when they land from a jump, their hips, knees, and ankles should all slightly flex to help absorb that impact, much like a spring does, okay? We also want to teach people, you know, I think teaching people the, uh, what I call the athletic stance um, is very important as well. Some of the, let me see if this is on the next slide. Yeah, so athletic stance looks a lot like this, right? Now this is maybe a little bit exaggerated, but she has her hips, knees, and ankles are all slightly flexed. Hips are back. Torso is leaning forward. Now I think she's leaning forward to maybe a little bit too much. Um, another thing you can do for athletic stance is to have your, your hands kind of in the ready position. It looks in this picture like she's about to do a broad jump, so she's probably going to do an arm swing. But in general, this is a pretty decent um, view of the athletic stance. Notice also the feet are hip width apart. Um, knees are directly over the feet and they're not pointing inwards in a bow legged appearance. We want to make sure that we avoid that. You really want to watch that when people are landing, especially females. They tend to land and let their knees come together at the bottom. That's going to create a lot of stress over the knees. It could lead to injury down the road. Okay, so focusing on keeping the knees out versus in is very important for plyometric activity as well as resistance training um, also. Let's jump back here and see if we missed anything. What I was just talking about is the inward valgus movement, right? That's where the knees come in, they bow in together. That does increase the risk of lower extremity injury. Okay, um, now, <clears throat> Other safety considerations, it is recommended that athletes have a certain level of strength before engaging in an intense plyometric activity. This is a guide that is typically used for by the NSCA for lower body plyometrics is that an athlete should be able to, to um, support or their one rep max should be at least one and a half times their own body weight before doing plyometrics. Um, so let's say if somebody weighs 150 pounds, they should be able to squat 225 in order to safely do plyometrics, right? One and a half times their body weight at 150 would be 150 plus 75, giving us 225, okay? That's a consideration. Now you're not gonna always do a one rep max with like adolescents, so that's why this, this is a guide to use, but don't let it, completely control what you do. Okay, you're gonna to have to use your own judgment to a certain degree as well, okay? Um, so here we see some other, some other safety considerations. Athletes who weigh more than 220 pounds might be an increased risk of injury with plyometrics. So that's where I was talking about earlier about if, if you have an athlete that weighs a lot, reducing the volume would be a good idea to help avoid um, putting too much strain on their joints, okay? Uh, and here's a specific direction you know, not to perform depth jumps greater than 18 inches if they weigh over 220 pounds. Now the surface is important as well. This may not be something that you have a lot of control over, but for plyometrics, you want um, a softer surface that has some, some give to it, okay? So um, there are some suggestions here, you know, a grass field, right? So if you can go out on the football field or, you know, even just going outside, right? Don't do your plyometrics on your driveway, do your plyometrics in your yard, okay? Um, if you have a floor that is suspended somewhat, like a basketball court or, you know, a rubber flooring, like gym flooring, that can be a good surface choice as well. So again, just to summarize that, don't do plyometrics on concrete or asphalt, do plyometrics on a wood floor, um, grass, turf, or rubber gym flooring. That's gonna be good, right?
softer landing surface is going to reduce the impact on your joints and leave your joints feeling happier versus doing plyometrics on a hard surface that's going to increase the load on your joints and they're going to be more mad at you <laughs> to be facetious. Uh, the area you need is going to depend on what you're doing, right? Um, if you're doing bounding and running drills, you're going to need a lot more area, okay? Um, but for vertical movements such as vertical jumping, drop jumping, etc., you may not need a lot of horizontal distance, but you do need to make sure that you have enough vertical distance. I know um, in my old house, I used to train in my basement and I could not jump in the basement. Even though my vertical has gone down greatly because I'm 45 years old, the ceiling was so low that I would hit my head. So just be mindful of that if you're doing some tr plyometric training in your own basement. Often the ceilings and basements are lower than they are like in the main floors of your house. Just be mindful of not hitting your head because when you're bald, especially when you hit your head on stuff, it tends to bleed a lot. Um, that's probably not something a lot of you have to worry about because you're not bald. Um, equipment, you know, you don't really need much equipment for plyometrics. You know, some boxes, that's probably kind of the extent of it, really. That's kind of it. You do want to make sure that you have uh, proper footwear. Although, I would say that doing some plyometrics barefoot is not a bad idea. You know, you do need to make sure your surface is soft, but, you know, like grass is a great surface to do some barefoot plyometric training on, right? Keeping your feet strong can really make your entire body strong. Relying on shoes too much can actually lead to some weakness in muscle imbalance developing. Um, I will also say, though, for lateral drills, you know, certain shoes are better than others for that. Like, I don't know if y'all remember the old Nike Freeze. They were really bad for lateral movement because the, the sole was, like, too soft and spongy that a lot of times people would roll their ankles when they're doing lateral plyometrics. So... If you're doing a lot of lateral movement, you want a, a shoe with a harder, harder sole, okay? Like a basketball shoe. Um, but you could also do lateral movements barefoot on a soft surface as well. You know, honestly, I would incorporate both because when you're playing your sport, you're going to be wearing shoes. So you would want to do some of your drills with shoes, but doing some barefoot stuff as well um, is a great way to really keep your foot strong, right? And if your foot is strong, that strength is going to translate all the way up the leg. Um, and then, of course, supervision, right? Technique is really important. So you, And you're not doing a ton of reps usually, so make sure you closely watch every rep your athlete is doing and be critical, right? Criticize their landing especially. Watch for the knee collapse inward. That is a huge thing. Every rep, stay on the athlete about that until they become very conscious of it because if they mentally um, – Think about driving their knees outward instead of inward. Over time, that will become second nature for them. Um, we can skip over this one. All right, so here are the tasks. I'm going to run through these other PowerPoints in about three minutes. Okay, I just wanted to show you this first. Uh, most of the questions in the critical thinking assignment are going to be based on this chapter, chapter 18, the plyometric chapter. The supplement I'm going to pull up next shows pictures of the different drills. And then chapter 19 is about speed training. I'm not going to give a full lecture on that. I'm just going to run through the slides quickly, really to point out the similarities between plyometric training and speed training, but then point out one other thing to you as well. So what I'm going to do quickly is bust out of this. Uh, I'm going to pull up this PowerPoint. Scroll back to the top. So this is a good PowerPoint to look at for you um, Sorry, I lost my uh, window box. There we go. Oh, darn it. Oh, wait, this is the right one. Okay, good. Okay, so what this has basically is all the different plyometric drills. Two foot ankle hop, very simple one. Now, single leg ankle hop, as we said, this is more intense. Two points of contact is less intense. One point of contact is more intense. So you would begin here, progress here, okay? 
Squat jump is a very basic plyometric drill that is good, easy to do, doesn't require too much technique. Um, then we have some, you know, this is a good one because it gives you that visual um, <clears throat> sort of carrot to go after, right? But also is sport specific potentially if you have like a basketball player jumping up for a rebound. Um, the tuck jump is a much more intense plyometric drill where you're bringing the knees up into the chest. Split squat jumps are, again, these, I would still call this a single point of contact, even though both feet are on the ground. They're doing different things. Um, so I'm, not, I'm just going to sort of scroll through these. A lot of different drills here. This is showing you some lateral drills, right? skipping um now basic skipping when you're skipping as a kid you probably do not get your knees up to waist height but skipping for athletic purposes you're going to get 90 degrees of hip flexion with every foot contact and you're going to get good arm action okay that's what i might call the power skip or the acceleration skip this is a good drill to use to get people faster right power skip there we go backward skip side skip I was trying to get to explosive step up. I like this one a lot. This is a good sort of safe drill for people to use. Um, lateral explosive step up. That's a good one. I was trying to get, okay, so here, that's just a basic box jump. Be careful with box jumps because people will miss the box and they will tear their shins up. I don't like really, I don't really like to use box jumps much anymore personally with clients, especially. I was trying to find one thing. Uh, all right, so here's sort of your landing ones. The drop freeze is just simply stepping off the box, landing softly and holding it. Uh, and then a depth jump is stepping off the box and immediately eccentrically loading the muscle and then jumping back up explosively. This tends to be considered to be like one of the most intense plyometrics that there is because you're really involving uh, an intense loading phase followed by an intense concentric phase. So this is more of an advanced drill. And this is taking it up another notch where you're jumping onto a second box, right? The danger level increases as you go here because the athlete could miss the second box. You know, bad things can happen. So just be use caution with these. And make sure you're doing these when you're not tired as well because being tired tends to make your technique uh, diminish, which would then increase your likelihood of getting injured. Uh, all right, so that should finish these up. That's a good one. Depth jump with the standing long jump. I've actually never tried that one. I might try that one later today. There we go, depth jump with 180 degree turn. So really there's like limitless variations of these things, as you all can see. Um, so you can be creative. You know, Think about movements that are included in the sport and you can develop your own plyometric drills to use. And here we get into some upper body stuff, which I'm not going to show, but they go through all the different types of throws. This is a good one I like to use to do the eccentric loading followed by the throw. You just need to make sure you have an athlete that is competent enough to catch the ball that you're going to drop to them, and it's not going to hit them in the face. And there's plyometric push-up example. All right, out of that one. Uh, one more quick thing to look at. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through this one. Um, this is showing you that basically there are some similar considerations for, for speed that are involved in plyometric training, the nervous system. You know, to be fast, your nervous system needs to be firing fast, much like it does for explosiveness, right? So you want to do your speed training early in the session when you're not tired. Speed also uses the stretch shortening cycle, okay? Much like we saw with plyometrics. Um, there are different phases that are kind of shown here. The planting phase to allow for changes of direction. Uh, maybe the most key point I wanted to make is speed is determined by two things. The stride length in the stride rate, okay? 
Athletes with longer legs have an advantage because they have longer strides, okay? But you can have too long of a stride, which would then diminish your stride rate. So there's like a happy medium that you want to find between the length of the stride and the rate of the stride that will vary based upon each individual athlete, okay? It's about finding that optimal combination for that given athlete, and that's gonna come through practice. So here there's just a lot of facts that are shown about running speeds. Again, I'm not gonna go through this. Um, stride length at maximum velocity. So for elite athletes, they tend to have a, a longer stride length at their maximum velocity than a novice does. Um, and they also have a faster rate, right? So an elite athlete is going to have a longer stride and a faster rate than a novice sprinter would. So they're both important. Um, now, technique can really improve your speed, right? There is a lot that goes into this that I'm not going to go into. Um, feel free to read this stuff on your own if speed is something that you are sort of interested in. If you want to ask me some questions, I'd be more than happy to give you personally some some information on this but you know simply learning how to have good arm action good uh, leg action can really make you faster in the absence of actually um, becoming more powerful right technique can really improve running speed greatly All right, so I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to run through this. Um, it, this PowerPoint goes into agility now as well. Um, so agility is another thing that is very dependent upon the nervous system. And plyometric training. So all three of these topics, plyometric training, speed training, agility training, they really all heavily involve the stretch shortening cycle, reaction time, and the nervous system. That's why they're all kind of grouped together into this uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so that is it for this week. Again, if you have specific questions about speed stuff, feel free to ask me. Um, otherwise, we're mostly going to focus on the plot metric chapter with regards to the questions and the critical thinking assignment. I will talk to you all next time.